before he starts, I will add a little bit to what Moe is saying. I've come across this letter from Warren Buffett to Monish a few months ago. I just want to read just a couple of lines. It says, Dear Monish, I remain incredibly impressed by what you have done, are doing, and will do at Dakshina. It is simply terrific, far more impressive than what business titans, investment gurus, and famous politicians ever ac accomplish. I'm glad my annual report doesn't get compared to the Dakshina annual report. It's an honor even to be quoted in it. With admiration, Warren Buffett. Monish, this is amazing. When you come and sit here, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you to start off with your relationship with Warren and what inspired you to follow his model? What are the learnings for, for us? You've mentioned that in your book, The Dando Investor. You've mentioned the Patels on the very first page, the successful Patels and the Gujaratis. And as you can see, a lot of us are from that ethnic background. But we'd like to learn what you have picked up and the synthesis of the Dando Investor and the success that you've seen. Give us some examples of the companies that you've invested in. And again, as Moe said, the anti-fragility part of it. We live through turbulent times up and down every few years, and we're going through some exceptionally difficult times at this moment. What do we make out of this? Where do we bounce back even better from this? One more thing. You had an amazing safari experience. You can tell us about that. We had to oh, offered some spots to white viewers to join Monish on the safari experience. One of the persons who went there was Herman Mashawa, who is from Johannesburg, a white viewer from Johannesburg, and the likely future president of South Africa. Monish, uh, you spent some time with him, and maybe you can share some inside information about that as well. And tell us about the Starbell experience as well, if you can. But welcome. And you. Thank you for that gracious introduction, Moyes and, and Pradeep. I wish my kids were here to listen to it. They might think a little higher of me than they do right now. But no, I've been overwhelmed by the hospitality, YPO you know, Management Chapter, Pradeep, and, and uh, the other YPOers. Uh, this is my 25th year in YPO. So I used to have a head full of hair when I joined. And, uh, and I, I spent many years going to the YPO Harvard program with some of you here, like Pradeep and Manish and so on. So it's wonderful to see them all again. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll just start with a story and then I'll maybe go into, into some of the questions you asked. This is a story from one of Buffett's letters to his investors in the 1950s. In 1626, Dutch, the, the original Dutch set, settlers in the New York area, what is now New York, they wanted to buy the island of Manhattan from the Native American Indians. So they nominated this guy, Peter Minuit, and they told Peter to negotiate with the American Indians to buy the island of Manhattan, which was great, had a great harbor and so on. So the deal was done for about 60 guilders, which is about $24. And the ownership of the island of Manhattan passed to the Dutch. And when most people hear the story, they think, oh, the Indians got taken. The whole island of Manhattan for twenty-four dollars, but let's say the Indians had a chief investment officer, and they gave the twenty-four dollars to the investment officer and said, "Please invest it for the benefit of the tribe." And let's say this investment officer was not too bright, but he could crank out about seven percent a year. So, if you get a seven percent return, there is something known as the Rule of 72, some of you might be familiar with the Rule of 72. So it's a kind of mathematical hack to know quickly <coughs> how much time it would take money to double. So if I know that I'm getting 7% a year compounded, I can just do 72 divided by 7. It's approximately 10. So at 7% compounded, it'll take 10 years to double. So the $24 will become $48 in 1636 and $96 in 1646. And uh, if you take 10 10 year periods, that's 10 doubles, right? So that's 2 to the power of 10. And uh, 2 to the power of 10 is 1024. And we can throw away the 24 to keep the math easy. So it's a thousand. So basically, if you compound it at 7% a year for 100 years, you would have 1000 times what you started with. 
24,000, $24 will become $24,000 by 1726. Then we go another 100 years, another 1,000, it will become $24 million, that's 1826. And then we go another 100 years, you are at $24 billion in 1926. And then you go another 100 years, 2026, and you're at $24 trillion. And of course, we are not yet at 2026, we are 2022. So if you take away like one, one double, so it'll be maybe 16, 17 billion, something like that. A 16, 17 trillion, sorry. Zero here, zero there, soon we have time. So what's the island of Manhattan worth without just the land value, you know, because undeveloped land there? What we know is that the entire wealth of every man, woman, and child on the planet is about 500 trillion. The wealth in the United States is about 130 trillion. And it is very unlikely that out of the 130 trillion, some 15% or something of it is just undeveloped land Manhattan because there's so much other assets in the US. And probably if you look at land values in Manhattan and extrapolate it out today, you would get to maybe a few hundred billion in value at the most. So the Indians actually got a good deal. The problem they had is they didn't have a good trust officer. <laughs> and they didn't end up with 17 trillion. So the thing about compounding, and this Einstein says that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. And he says that, as we saw in this example, if you go for a long enough period of time, so the interesting thing about the way compounding works, so let's say we go back 100 years from 1626 to 1526, go back 100 years, and we had 2,400 cents in 1626, and you would have 2.4 cents in 1526. And in 1516, you would be at 1.2 1 cents. And uh, so one cent basically grows to the 16, 17 trillion. So there are three variables which are interplaying with each other. There is the rate of compounding. There is the length of the runway. And there is the starting amount, the amount to start with. And you can actually massage these three. So one thing about the rule of 72 is it works, it's very flexible. So 7% a year will double in 10 years. Or 10% a year will double in 7 years. So if you know the interest rate, you can figure out the period for the double. And if you know the period in which, so let's say I want my money to double in 5 years. I can just do 72 divided by 5, which is approximately 15. So I know that if I get a 15% rate of return, it'll double. So actually, the rule of 72 is interesting because it works both ways. If you know the interest rate, you know how long it takes. And if you know the period, you can figure out what the effective compounding rate should be. And Warren Buffett, I think when he, he bought his first stock when he was 11 years old, and he says he was wasting his time up to then. And uh, I think by then he was like probably 17 or 18. He had figured out how compounding works and such. I think he had a good handle on that. He used to do a whole bunch of different jobs when he was a teenager. And he had about $10,000 saved up when he was 18, which in today's money would be about 120000 which is quite a bit for a 18-year-old to have saved up through part-time jobs and so on. And uh, he knew that with that 10,000, he was well on his way towards compounding. And actually his, his compounding journey started at around the time he was 18 years old and uh, he started to invest in such. So my, my younger daughter, when she was 18, just before she started college, she had done a summer internship and she made about $5,000 and she didn't really have any expenses. So she had saved the 5,000. And so I told her, look, you can put this money in an IRA, which is a retirement account. 
in the US. And so the growth of that money gets tax deferred until you pull it out, which might be when you're 65 or 70 or something. So I asked her to put it into a IRA. And I said, look, it's $5,000. You're 18. If you are able to compound it at 15% a year, no 72, we'll be down every five years. And so what would the money be when you're 68? I choose all these periods because easy on the math. So it's 50 years, 10 five-year periods. That's 1,000. So 5,000 becomes 5 million. And now I have her attention. And, uh, and then I said, when you're 19, you might do another internship and you have some more skills. Maybe you make, let's keep the math exactly the same, like 5750, which is 15% more than the, what you made at 18. And again, at 68, that would end up with another 5 million. And at, at 20, if you do that with 65 or 6700, it'll again end up being another 5 million. And the 5 million keeps coming and at some point, I told her you'll graduate, and you might be able to save more than that. Someone might pay you a good amount. And so, I think the important thing with compounding is that if the length of the runway is really long, then you don't need a high rate of compounding, and you don't also need a high amount of starting amount of capital. So, it's just the interplay of those three. And if you, if you ask Buffett, a genie came to him and said, Mr. Buffett, you can have any wish you want. He would, he would basically say, I only want one wish, which is that when I die and they look at my corpse, they should just say, man, he was old. And he doesn't want to live because he likes us or any of that. He just wants to compound. And so he's, he just turned 92 a few weeks ago. And so 74 years of compounding so far for him. Still in good health, doing doing well, going strong. And so I think that one of the things that the interesting thing about investing is that the individual investor, the individual retail investor, unlike a lot of other fields or areas, the individual retail investor actually has an advantage over the professional which is usually not the case. Usually you would have people who are experts in their fields who would have the advantage over some weekend mechanic or something. But the thing is that the two or three things that are going for the individual investor is in investing, the lower the amount of capital you have to put to work, the wider the range of opportunities. So as the size of the capital grows, the range of things that you can invest in keeps narrowing down. And so if you look at someone like Warren Buffett, he needs to put tens of billions to work at a time. And there are only so many things you can put to work with tens of billions. Whereas my daughter with $5,000, she could put it almost anywhere. The other thing is that the other advantage the individual investor has is that you really need to know nothing about investing. So you can just index. So if one were to invest in the S&P 500 index, over 100 years, it's delivered 9% a year. And probably in the next few decades, most of periods back and forth, but I would say that highly likely the next few decades also it will deliver 8, 9% a year, which is above what the compounding rate for the Indians was. So you get 9% with knowing nothing and just buying and holding forever. And most fund managers have a very difficult time beating the index. They have a difficult time getting more than the 9% a year. And the reason they have a difficult time is, is for two reasons. One is, so if I buy an index, five basis points, 10 basis points, 0.05% <coughs> or 0.1% is the amount of the fees every year. If I'm given to a professional manager, usually it's one or two percent a year. So first, they have to overcome the one or two percent to just match the index, right? So the index is doing nine, 
they have to do 10 or 11 percent, which becomes very hard. And so that's why 80, 80, 85 percent of money managers lag the index. The second reason they lag the index is that the index is too dumb to know that it owns Apple and it owns Alphabet and it owns Microsoft and it owns Starbucks and it's too dumb to ever sell these companies. So it just sits there owning all these great businesses, never sells them. And when you look at the professional mutual fund managers, in the US their typical annual turnover rate is like 80 to 100 percent, which means that their holding period for a stock is one year or less. And Buffett says that the stock market is a mechanism to transfer wealth from the active to the inactive. So that's so basically the professional managers do themselves no favors. They've got the fees <coughs> they have to charge for, which gives them a, a disadvantage. And then they are they will buy Apple or Alphabet or Microsoft, but they will not hold it. And they'll typically buy it after everyone else has bought it. And uh, and so on. So in many ways, actually, for the individual investor, when I met Buffett. For lunch, there was a friend of his, Rick Gorin. So there were three of them who were really close friends in the 60s Rick Gorin, <coughs> Charlie Munger, and Warren Buffett. And Rick Gorin fell off the face of the earth, like mid 70s. We never heard from him after that. So one of, one of the first questions I asked him is I said, Warren, are you in touch with Rick? What happened to Rick? And I was just, it's just like an idle question. I was just trying to figure out, let me get some historical facts here about what went on with Rick. And he converted that question into a, he converted all our questions into great learning, great learning opportunities. So he said in 73, 74, the US stock market went through a very severe correction. Actually, it was more severe than the 1929 crash. It was just in slow motion. It took place over two years. And Rick was leveraged. He had margin loans and so on at that time. And those he got margin calls and he owned a bunch of Berkshire Hathaway stock. So Buffett said, I bought his Berkshire Hathaway stock from him at that time at $40 a share. <coughs> That's what the shares were trading at that time. Those shares now trade at over 400000 a share. So it was a 10,000 X in the last 48 years or so. And uh, so basically, Rick lost some of his uh, wealth at that time. But then Warren actually made a statement. He said that if you are even a slightly above average investor who spends less than they earn, you cannot help but get rich over a lifetime. So basically, the uh, formula is really simple. You have some kind of a savings rate. You have a very long runway. One of the sad parts about our conversation today is we really should have met 50 years ago. <laughs> there are too many gray hairs, or in my case, no hair. I also got started late in my compounding journey because I heard about Buffett for the first time when I was 30. And so I said 30, okay, not too bad, better than 50 or 70, but 20 would have been better. And I really wish that some of these compounding things were part of the curriculum in high school. I think that's really where kids can get the most benefits. We are taught probabilities and we are taught compounding and we are taught all these things as concepts in classrooms, but they don't connect the dots. They don't connect the dots with wealth creation and savings and so on. I think with that, maybe we can open to questions or what would you suggest? So it's a more issue. Tell us about the successful investments you've made. And then how do you find the long runway in your investments and the stability of the return year after year? Yeah. So one thing about the investing business, and there was a very famous investor, John Templeton. He was a global investor. He used to invest all over the world. He passed away a few years ago. And he said that even the very best investor 
will be wrong one out of three times. So this is a forgiving business where you can have a high error rate and still do well. So if you're a brain surgeon, you can't screw up one out of three times or even one out of 10 times or one out of 20 times. That would work for you. Be out of business pretty soon. But in, in the investing business, you could be wrong even half the time and still do well. And I know I mentioned the index uh, with the 9%. So the 9% a year for, for the index is really coming out of about 4% of the stocks. So basically one in 25 stocks over time delivers great results. And the other 24 out of 25 don't do great. And that's another reason why the active managers have a hard time because how do you get to the one out of the 25? You might get to the other one of the 24 and thinking that's one of the 25. And you might skip it and the, the index just holds all 25. So it has that in the mix. And uh, so I think the, the, the approach to investing, if you move from the index to stock picking, which is I think a significant move, I would, I would actually suggest for most of you to stick to indexing. But if you move to active stock picking, then, then I think what you're looking for is you're looking for anomalies and you're looking for things which make no sense. Like they hit you in your head by a two, two by four. So in my case, I think if I can find a couple of stocks in a year, we are doing pretty well. Uh, even if I sometimes I can find one stock in a year, that's great. So we are looking for things that are aberrations. The other interesting thing about the stock market is that if you, if I were to try to buy the partial or complete ownership of a business in a private negotiated transaction, basically that type of transaction typically will be an intelligent buyer facing an intelligent seller. And typically it will end up happening at some rational or maybe even exuberant price. Unless there is some kind of distress at that time, that may give you some kind of a, a better deal. But in the stock market, we don't have to do negotiated transactions. And, uh, and so if I look at all the stocks in the New York Stock Exchange, let's say they were in a newspaper, all the stock codes, 52 week range, all of that. And I threw a dart <coughs> at that page of all the stock quotes and I look at any random stock that the dart hits, the 52 week range on that stock price is going to be something like $60 to $100 or like $55 to $110. Usually there will be a pretty wide range. And this would be happening in normal years where there's nothing unusual going on, just the normal but if I were to look at a private business and I go to the seller of the private business and I say, hey, listen, I'm interested in buying your business. The guy said, okay, it's, it's worth 10 million. And if I go back the next day and I ask him, he would say, it's 10 million all again. Then I go back the third day, he'll tell me, listen, idiot, it's still 10 million. And if I go back every single day and he gave me a price, the band of that price would probably not change more than nine or nine and a half million to 11 million. It would be a pretty tight band. But the same business if it was traded on the stock market would not have a range of nine to 11. It would have a range of five to 15. And so auction driven markets create a much wider disparity in pricing. So because of the nature of auction driven markets, you get stock prices which either undervalue a business or overvalue a business. Hardly ever do they actually correctly value the business. And if I'm looking to buy a business, there are always 50,000 stocks in the world and there'll always be businesses that will be severely undervalued and there'll always be businesses that are very exuberantly overvalued and everything in the middle. So basically knowing that, what I'm, the stock market is interesting. If you said to yourself, 
I only want to invest in businesses which are available for one time earnings. I'm going to get my money back in one year in earnings. Because there's 50,000 stocks, there are plenty of stocks trading in the world where the PE is one. If you said I want my money back in two years, you can find plenty with a PE of two. So pretty much the stock market can give you whatever your screening criteria is, which is wonderful. What a place. And uh, I'm going after Kenya to Kazakhstan. And I've never been to Kazakhstan before. And actually, quite frankly, I'm more excited about the Kazakhstan trip than the amazing safari. Because work is more fun than fun. And uh, we have exciting things to, to discover. There's a, I have a couple of investments in Turkey. And Turkey is a, an interesting place in terms of the stock market. I've been going there for about four years. So if you look at the entire Turkish market, 80% of it is either owned by insiders or foreigners. And that 80% of the market hardly trades. It just is static. The other 20% is owned by re retail Turkish investors. They're really not investors. They're speculators. That 20% turns over every nine days. So it's hyperactive in terms of how much volume there is. I was actually surprised at the volume. So most of the retail Turkish investors... Their modus operandi, they actually, in, in Turkish, they don't even call it investing in the stock market. They call it playing the market. And uh, so their model is, I want to invest at 10 a.m. And I want to sell at 3 p.m. And I want to make 10%. And that's my model. Pack up my shop at 3 p.m. And then next day again, start at 10 a.m. And uh, good luck with that. And uh, so, like Buffett said, transfer of wealth from the active to the inactive. <clears throat> Turkey, they have an extreme case of that. So when people are doing that, they aren't looking at the business. And they aren't looking at the value of the business. So when I looked at businesses in Turkey, it's a bit of a crazy place. This inflation rate is 85%. Currency go is going through crazy devaluations. And most foreign investors, everyone has left the scene. And uh, that's a good time to enter. And uh, so... Three years back, I have a good friend in Turkey who's a Buffett, Munger, Graham disciple. So I just told him, listen, can we just go visit all the businesses in your portfolio? He said, oh yeah, sure, that'd be fun. So I was going through 2018, I went to visit a bunch of companies. And then 2019, he took me to this company, which is, they've got a bunch of businesses, but they are, the main businesses, they are a warehouse owner and operator. They own 12 million square feet of warehouses. And you could sell those warehouses in six months or three months. They're all prime, 99% leased, inflation index leases, Amazon, Ikea, Carrefour. These are the tenants. So that those warehouses were worth about a billion dollars. There was about 200 million of debt. And the market cap was 20 million. So we are paying 20 million for a business that you can liquidate for 800 million. This is better than a PE of one. So I said, where do I sign? And uh, I met the management, the father, son who run it. They seemed perfectly normal, honest people to me. And uh, then I thought I wouldn't get any stock because 20 million market cap, what are we going to do? But uh, we ended up for $7 million with one third of the company. And, uh, and then I said, okay, so we own a third of the company. And then it's not just, so the liquidation value was, was the 800 million at the time, but they're really good capital allocators. And now the liquidation, liquidation value probably is over a billion, billion two. And Turkish real estate actually is depressed. So it's actually probably worth double that probably. And on top of that, they are smart about how they invest. So my game plan there is just to spend my time talking to YPOs <laughs> and do nothing. Just sit there. And, and I'm going to Kazakhstan because there's an airport operator in Turkey. They operate 15 airports in eight countries. And 3% of airports in the world are privately operated. 97% are operated by the governments and municipalities and so on. And that 3% will grow because it's a no-brainer actually to give it to a private operator. So they, during the pandemic, they did a deal in Kazakhstan when there were no flights in 2020, 2021, where they bought the Almaty airport, which is the number one airport in Kazakhstan. 
for 400 million. And actually, most of these airport deals are BOT, you get them for 30, 40 years. This is forever. It's an outright purchase. And they're putting in about 200 million of CapEx, so we have 600 million. And I think in a few years, they'll be making about 200 million a year on it. And so that asset is a tremendous asset, but there's 14 other assets, and it trades in Turkey. So that's awesome. And, uh, and a bunch of these airports are not in Turkey. And, uh, and the interesting thing about TAB, the airport company, is even the airports in Turkey, all their revenue is in euros. All their revenue in all their airports is in euros. So the lira devaluation is irrelevant. And uh, even with the warehouse operator, they have cement and steel and land, which is automatically inflation indexed. So again, the inflation rate doesn't matter there because it just adjusts. So that's what I did. In Turkey, I just looked at investments where inflation becomes a tailwind, not a headwind. And then I just have the people I'm playing, I'm buying the stock for, like Buffett says, it's like playing bridge with people who've been told it does no good to look at the cards. And uh, that's the way it is. So that's uh, what I do. Basically, I look for anomalies and uh, just have to be patient. The number one skill is patience and uh, let the game come to you. One issue, one question, and then I'll pass on to the others in the, in the room. In the last three or four, three years or so, two significant changes have happened in, in, in the markets. Where the, because of the pharmaceutical companies and COVID medications, pharmaceutical companies' share prices have grown. Defense companies' contractors' prices have grown dramatically after the Russian war. And in between, trade companies, uh, shipping, trade companies. Did you see these trends? Did you invest in these? Are these in within what you call your circle of competence? I'm too dumb to do these. So I actually skipped the entire US healthcare sector because it doesn't run on market forces, it runs on other forces other than the market. Yeah, so I think anything in healthcare or pharmaceuticals or anything, I just don't even look at because I don't think I bring it into the party. Usually I think that if you look at things in this type of a lens, my general sense is you'll be late to the party. So I think that there's a lot of smart people in the markets. And the question you would ask is, if you look at pharmaceutical companies today, are they still a great deal? They may be, but they're not obvious to me. So I would say that probably it's better to look where the where the, it's not in the headlines. You, there's a friend of Charlie Munger's, John Ariega, he passed away, I think, a couple of years back, multi billionaire. And John only invested in his entire life within two miles of the Stanford University campus. So he only invested in real estate and he only invested in real estate just around the Stanford, Stanford campus. And if you walked with him in that area, he could just look at every building and tell you what the rent is, what the cost of the building is, what the history of the building is, the pricing. He knew that area code. So what is John area of circle of confidence? It is not real estate. It is not California real estate. It is not even Northern California real estate or Bay Area real estate. It is real estate in a very really small geography. So the thing about investing is that we don't need to know. So if I were talking to John, I say, hey, John, pharmaceuticals are doing great. He would just go straight over. He wouldn't even pay attention. And if I told him, listen, uh, Southern California real estate is doing great, he would not care about that either. But if I talk to him about some particular building on El Camino, like near the Stanford campus or something, he'd be all ears. He'd be interested. And basically what he did is that when things got very euphoric in these areas, he unloaded the entire portfolio and he went completely to cash. And he could clearly tell when the ratio of rents to, to prices people were willing to pay him, 3% cap rates or whatever, he was out. And then when the downturns came, he just bought it all out. So he just did this a few times and mostly <coughs> just held on to it. So basically, and I think in investing, the important thing is the first most important question to ask, is it in my circle of confidence? Is something I'm looking at, I understand really well. And uh, you don't need I don't have a clue about pharmaceuticals. I don't have a clue about defense stocks. I've never spent much time looking at them. And again, I don't like to, that again gets away from market forces. So I just stay away from something driven by the government and so on. 
And so I think the thing is that because these are auction driven markets, because people are vacillating between fear and greed all the time, there's all kinds of things going on with individual companies all the time. And so if there's something that you can understand well, and the pricing is not like 20% off, I would say that the pricing is 80% off, 90% off, that should get you excited. Thank you, Mr. That was very interesting. So I've got a couple of questions. One is, if you look at a market like this, how do you react? I don't really care about the market. I don't mean the Kenyan market. I'm just saying, I don't care about any market. I care about individual businesses and individual stocks. So I don't really pay attention to, I don't care about the interest rates. I don't pay, care about Fed policy. I don't care about the inflation rates. All of that to me is in the noise level. If I look at a Turkish real estate company, what does it matter what all these factors are in this end? So when we invested three years ago, the lira was five lira to the dollar. Now I think it's almost 19 lira to the dollar. So we almost suffered a four to one devaluation. In dollar terms, the market cap now is 150 million. So it went up 7x in the last three years. It's still undervalued, it's, still, it's worth over a billion. But it went up 7x and the lira collapsed and Turkey has got crazy economic policies and we've got the war going on and all these different things going on. So I would say that the for most businesses, the micro will trump the macro. So the specific things around the business will be the ones that will dominate the long-term results. And, uh, and if we were smart enough to understand Amazon 10 years ago or something, it didn't matter what else happened. If you want the stock and you sell it, that, that would be just fine. So I think the important thing in investing is to keep it really simple. So usually the macro factors are really hard to figure out. So what is the trajectory of the war in Ukraine? Who knows? When does it end? Who knows? How long will the Fed keep it raising interest rates? Who knows? So I don't even try to answer these questions. And if you look at if you look at most of you in the room, you know, you're running businesses. When you're running the business, you're not running it based on some macro factors. There are three or four variables that control most of the outcome of your business. And you're focused on those three, four variables. And as an investor, I need to hone in on those same variables. <laughs> and then I can see, okay, these are the three or four variables that affect this business. Can I have a viewpoint on these variables, which is high probability? And if I feel that I can do that, then there could be a basis to make an investment. And the other thing is, one of the things about the world in general is whatever period of time you look at, looks like the worst time. <laughs> this time looks terrible, but the financial crisis looked terrible too. And March 2020 with COVID looked terrible too. And the Great Depression looked terrible too, and the Vietnam War looked terrible. There's a whole bunch of things that looked terrible. So I think the world always looks, if you look at it in a certain way, looks terrible. And what is also true is that this too shall pass. So whatever is dominating the headlines and taking up a lot of space, someday the Ukraine conflict will be solved. We don't know how and when, but it will get solved at some point. And someday US inflation will get under control and someday you've got a new leader in Kenya, you've got a new president, and he might make some great changes and that might be great as well. So uh, I think that the world has a way of getting itself into trouble and also the way of getting out of trouble. And uh, so this too shall pass is a good way to think about it. Mr. Malaysia, said this to you publicly, I say publicly you love the book, don't know this, and I haven't by my bedside. I read it five years ago, it's still as far as we so think that. I want to ask you about exits. I love your story, which I tell often about the Chuck review, the Mahabharata story, but to get out is more difficult. It's great to get in, but then you don't know the story about how to get out. I still don't know how to get out. So, 
So what is the right time? How do you time it right? How do you know that you had enough? And how do you find it out? Particularly on illiquid investments, you invest in the stock market, I invest in venture. It's a little more illiquid. How do you get out? Getting out is much harder than getting in. Yeah, so one of the chapters in my book, which Pradeep, did you send it to them or are they going to get it? They're going to get it, okay, yeah. So it's from the Mahabharata, you know, the, the story of Abhimanyu, most of you are probably familiar with the story where he's a fetus in the womb of his mom and Arjuna, who's a great warrior, is explaining how a warrior can enter a Chakravyu formation in a battlefield, which is complicated, and also how he can exit. So when he explains the second part, which is how you exit a Chakravyu, the pregnant mother falls asleep. And so the Abhimanyu was listening in the womb only got half the stone. So he only learned how to get in, he didn't learn how to get out. There's a famous investor, Phil Fisher, who had, a, who had a great approach to buying great businesses. And near the court, he said, if the job is done right, one would never need to sell. And he also says that from that lens, every sell decision is a mistake. And of course, in your case, you've got length of, the funds have a finite, life and so on, so that uh, complicates things a bit. I don't have a, I stay away from early stage investing completely. It's, I think it's really difficult. And I also stay away from private equity investing, again, because of liquidity and so on. So even in the public markets, which I live by such as the public markets, sometimes getting out can take time. Sometimes when we are trying to get out of the position, it might take us a year because the liquidity is not there or whatever else. But yeah, I think that buying a stock is easy. And there are a couple of things that happen with buying a stock. You really understand the business only after you own the stock. You really don't understand the business while you study it. It's after you own it. And you really understand it really well when it drops 30 or 40%. Mm -hmm. That's when you get a really good understanding of the business. So the selling part is really hard. I think the number one skill that investors can bring to the party is to be very patient. Patience is the number one skill that can be helpful. Because like I said, you look at a company at 60 to 100 in a year, and, and so it may be going through some temporary pickup or whatever else, and study and stick to circle of competence, and then hopefully the sell decisions can be a little easier. But I think, in your case, I don't know what I can advise you because you have earlier stage businesses. Of course, in your case, you can also tolerate a very high mortality rate. So you could have most venture funds will make most of their returns in 10% or 5%, one in 10 bets or one in 20 bets works and that takes care of the portfolio. The game there is not so much about the liquidity. It's about whether you have a winner and a big winner, then the others may not matter so much. But I'm probably the wrong guy to ask the question you're asking. Great answer. Thank you. I think you were the right person, and then now I, I hope you have the right answer. I suggest we start dinner, and as we are both served, halfway through we can resume question and answer, and meantime, hopefully you can have a bite to eat as well. And please, to ask the questions, because that's the only way that we will get the best out of Polish and to learn. So that's a great question. And in 1956, please have a seat. Please keep eating. So in 1956, there was a Senate hearing, a U.S. Senate, where Senator Fulbright, who famous for the Fulbright Fellowships and all that, was questioning Ben Graham, who is Warren Buffett's teacher. So he said, Mr. Graham, there's a stock that trades at $10 and you think it's worth 20. And what are the forces that would make this stock actually go to 20? So what Ben Graham said was, he said, Senator, this is one of those mysteries to which I have no answer. But what I can tell you is that if the intrinsic value is 20, it will get there eventually. And so, Basically, value is its own catalyst. So whenever I invest or Buffett invests or people who are in this framework of investing, 
we never focus on catalysts. So when this company was trading at 20 million and you know it's worth 800 million or whatever, I had no idea whether it takes six months, one year, two years, five years, 10 years to get there. I had no idea when it would get there, but I do think it will get there. So far what has happened is that we've gone from 20 million to 150 million in three years with a lot of turmoil, macro turmoil going on. It's still got a, but on the other hand, they've raised the value of the business in the meanwhile. So it doesn't matter. We can be patient. We are, what I look at is, and I told my investors this, I told them, listen, when we give you a valuation, it's based on the stock market value, right? But between us girls, we understand what the real value is. And so just understand that and take it from there. So at some point it will it will manifest itself. Because we believe in our guru Ben Wang. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you've talked to us about Kazakhstan and Turkey. At our table here we were contrasting uh, investment opportunities in Africa and in India. We were also talking about the UK and its troubles. What regions of the world excite you most these days? Yeah, I don't I actually don't think about it that way. Turkey was a little bit of an aberration because I was just curious. Uh, about four years ago because I saw that there was a lot of turmoil from a lot of fiscal and monetary perspective and I also would see a lot of people exiting. So I just wanted to explore what was possible in Turkey and so I had his friend and so I just told him let's just go meet your businesses in your portfolio and so on. Once I'm outside the US, historically uh, when I first started investing and until maybe seven, eight years ago, almost all my investments were in the US. When I invest in the US, I rarely if ever meet management. So the odds that I would lose money in the US because of outright fraud is as close to zero as you can get. I will lose money because I'm stupid, but not because of outright fraud. Once I leave the US and I'm going to Africa or Turkey or India or wherever, the odds of outright fraud become elevated. They're going down in all these places, but they're still elevated. One of the reasons, one of the things I need to assess is the integrity and ethics and competence of management, and how they would treat outside shareholders, that sort of thing. So uh, there's a layer, there's another layer of kind of due diligence that comes in for companies outside the U.S. But uh, it also takes a lot of effort, right? Because there's a lot of travel and drill down, and also when I'm dealing with different countries. There may be many things about the country that I may not understand. So I would rather at this point spend more time in a place like Turkey, becoming more, more familiar than start looking at another country. On the other side, I only make two investments a year. So there are 50,000 stocks and we need to buy two. And then there's John Ariega who's within two miles of the Stanford campus. And he's doing just fine. He's not even going to the next county. So I think that one doesn't need to cast a really wide net. I think it's better to be an inch wide and a mile deep than a mile wide and an inch deep. So the, it'll expand by osmosis, but I'm not looking to specifically expand it. So like Turkey is interesting, there's a Coke bottler in Turkey. And I like big businesses like the Coke bottler. So the Coke bottler in Turkey is the only Coke bottler in Turkey. And 20% of the company is owned by the Coca-Cola company. And the Coca-Cola company sits on their board. And I met these people. And they're really high quality people. And they also happen to own 49% of the Coke bottler in Pakistan. Which is, and at some point I think that Coke owns the other 51%. At some point Coke will probably sell that 51% down to these guys. And besides Pakistan and Turkey, they have 11 other countries in the region. Like they have got Jordan, and Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, all these places. And uh, uh, Coke is a really good business. The Coke bottling business is not as good as Coke. But it's still, it's still a good business. 
And uh, so when you have a business like that based in Turkey, it so you have all these four quarters in the world that are publicly listed, and they trade like a certain multiple. And then there's the co-founder in Turkey, which trades at a discount, only because it's based in Turkey. And so that kind of makes it interesting. I I went to I met them once you know, with the co-partners, and I really liked them. And I told them that uh, so if you go on YouTube and you do a search on me, there's a talk I gave at you know Sir Kalpani Irvine, which was about a two and a half hour talk on the business model of co. So I told these guys that hey, listen, when I met them the first time, that you might want to. Look at that video I did, and that video actually got like quarter million views. So they looked at the video, and then they called me. They said we need to discuss our business with you. <laughs> so I met them for lunch. And then I said, uh, "What do you guys do? What do you guys want to drink?" So they both said regular Coke, and I said, "Okay, I'm also going to have regular Coke." And then it was a really funny meeting because they're asking me all these questions about what they should do. Should we make this investment? Should we set up this bottling plant? I said, you are the guys running the business. I'm just the outsider. But the thing is, I think that uh, so I really enjoyed actually. We didn't invest in them so far because they were. It wasn't as cheap as the warehouse operator in Turkey. But so I think that a place like Turkey serves up companies like this, which is really fun. It's good. <coughs> So I was on autopilot. Pradeep set up the plan, and we just said, "Okay, he's the boss. He knows what's going on here." And uh, so it was really fun, wonderful because we spent three nights, I think, at this Gencha camp. That was uh, Gencha Gencha camp. It was really nice. And I think in the Mara, a lot of game and good driver and good drives. It was really nice, and I, I think the staff was really good. And then we spent a couple of nights at Mr. Branson's camp, which I think was a lot more expensive. But I would go with the Genji over Mr. Branson, which you respect to. There's a chapter on Branson in my book. Our friend was interested in the Chakravyu chapter, but there's a chapter on Branson which you guys might enjoy. But a very nice facility. But I just felt it was kind of more corporate type thing versus the other one felt like more like family. And then the one that I Really liked, uh, we really liked a lot. A lot was the, the Star Trek. Yeah, Lois Star was a Star Trek. That was just a out of the world experience. We actually didn't even go on any drive. We just wanted to be in the room. So that was great. Yeah, so I uh, really enjoyed. I think I think it's, it's very therapeutic. And, uh, and the staff and the people. These I think these lodges because they're so small. It's difficult to imagine that they. The business model is that great. There's so much staff and things, and all the stuff has been brought in and all that. It's really kind of like a labor of love, and so I'm grateful they did that. And the star, the star bed, I thought whoever designed that place was a genius. Really well done. The best meal we had was last night at the, the star bed place. We made a goat curry. Chapati, jeera rice, really well done. Actually, in the bush, in the bush, yeah. And he was like grilling it right there. It was really nice. It was great. Huh? Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. So, uh, what are your thoughts on the new age investing? Companies trading it, huge losses, massive multiples, and they gone down. How do you feel about this? So. There's a, I think a year, more than one year or two years after the Buffett lunch. So I'll answer your question in a, as on a story. <laughs> so everything has to be a story, right? So I'll tell you a story. When we set up this lunch with Buffett, we had to interact with his assistant, and I got to know Debbie really well. And so my friend Guy and I told Debbie, hey, Debbie, we'd really like to take you out for lunch. So she said, okay, so when you come for the annual meeting, she said, normally the annual meeting is on a Saturday. She said, come on a Thursday, I'm relatively free. I can go to lunch, but Friday becomes crazy. So while I said, okay, we'll come on Thursday. And uh, we went to lunch with Debbie. And uh, and what I found was, found out was that lunch with Debbie was better than lunch with Warren. Okay, because 
This is how a lot of as a Debbie, between us girls, can we talk? She said, Warren is shorting on it. So I, then I would ask him, does Warren have a cell phone? Okay, because this was in 2008 or 2009. And she starts laughing. She said, yeah, he has a cell phone, but it's in my drawer, my, my desk. <laughs> and he doesn't really know how to use it. So he said, she said, when he goes on a trip, I charge it and give it to him. <laughs> and he only knows how to call me on that cell phone. So he doesn't know if someone answers or whatever, what to do. So she said that whenever he needs to reach someone, he'll call me, but usually he doesn't even use the phone. So anyway, we, were, we went to lunch with, uh, with Debbie a few times. And uh, one time we were going to lunch with her, I think in 2010 or 2011. So we went to the Berkshire headquarters. Warren was standing at the elevator. When we got to the hotel floor, he was standing at the elevator, apparently to greet us. So, you know, like a Fortune 10 company CEO with nothing to do but to greet some yo-yos who come to lunch with the assistant. So he says, uh, he says to guy and me, do you want a tour of headquarters? I said, sure. So he's taking us around, showing us all the memorabilia, different deals he's done, different things. So then he takes us into his private office, right? And in his private office, there's a box on his desk. And the box says, too hard. And this is a very famous box. So Buffett says that 99% of things that come to his desk in terms of investment ideas fall in the too hard pile. So they go into that box, means I'm not interested. So I looked at the box and I told Warren, uh, the box is empty. Like, it's supposed to be full. He said, oh, we'll fill it right now. So he takes a bunch of papers and it. <laughs> it's full. So to answer your question, basically most things we look at go into the too hard pile. Means there's no point wasting brain cells. So if a company has never made money, I can't tell what the future is. I don't know what's going on. The rest of the world is excited about it. Whatever. Too hard pile. <laughs> and 99% of stuff should just go with the two hard part. And then once in a while, a Turkish warehouse company comes in, which doesn't look so hard. Then we can buy that. <laughs> so, hope you like the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they want to get you a mic. Thank you. What would be your top picks for the next 10 years? Stock picks? Top, top pick. Oh, yeah. Top stock picks. So I only have a couple of ideas a year. So there's not much out there in the sense that I don't have a long list. And half the stuff I buy ends up not going anywhere. So I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> After already eight more now, maybe you already have a couple of names. Just read between the lines. <laughs> it's not so much for month of this and that. It's whatever you sell, 40% is coming to me. So the $100 bottle, $40 goes to the airport operator. And then now we're left with $60. Then $25 or $30 is the cost of the bottle. And $10, $15, $20 is the cost to run the shop. And then the company operating the shop makes like $10 or something. So the airport operator, basically what happens, it's like lambs to the store. So when an aircraft comes in, 150 or 200 people in the aircraft, let's say 150 people. On a per, uh, per passenger basis, so that, air, that airplane will end up with duty-free sales for all 150 people together of about $1,500. So one airplane, will bring in about $1,500 of top line revenue, which means that the airport operator gets about $600 for each airplane that's coming in just on the duty. And when these concessions are given to these airport operators, the, the government which gives a concession will set the per passenger fee. So they give the airport operator. So when this airplane comes in, the 1500 the 150% if it's an international flight, it's about $15 to $20 per passenger. So about like $3,000 or something per airplane coming in as their fee. The duty-free portion is not regulated. So they just give them 
So the duty free is whatever you can charge, whatever you want, make whatever you want, do whatever you want. Same with food and beverage, not really regulated too much. So there's some parts of the business that are regulated, like the this per passenger fee and so on, but some parts that aren't. And so it's a kind of a blend of all of that. And what was interesting about the Kazakhstan one that they got was that they, like I said, they didn't have a BOT, they owned it outright. And Kazakhstan was the only airport they got where they actually had the fueling. Normally the airport operator doesn't deal with stuff <coughs> on the runway and all that and on the ground. So fueling is, that's the biggest piece of the pie for them. And uh, Kazakhstan is landlocked, so everything has to come either by land or air. So anyway, so that's the, the economics of that business. The difficulties in that business are that you can get animal spirit. So when there's a new airport being announced to be privatized, then there are multiple people who want to get those duty free screens and all that. And the danger is that they can overbid. So if they overbid, then you end up with a situation where you pay too much for the concession and then it doesn't quite work out. And, uh, but one of the things that I think TAV Airports has going for it is that the geographies they operate in does not attract a lot of the big boys. So, like, when they were doing the Kazakhstan deal, nobody wanted to do the deal. Especially in 2020 and 2021, nobody wanted to buy an airport when there's no traffic. So anyway, that's a, I really enjoyed in that particular case, <laughs> I knew the airport business generally had good economics, but when I studied it, it was a lot of fun to study. And so now I, I think we own about 5 or 6%. So every 20th bottle of Johnny Walker is for the benefit of my investors. So it should be good. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So I'm um, just switching gears. Can you talk more about your Vachina Foundation and how you get those 61% pass rates? Sure. Go ahead. Just a quick question. I've been dying to take the mic so everyone can hear you. Just a quick question. I have to leave. I apologize to interrupt with you. But I've been dying to know, talked about, you like telling stories, and you've talked about a lot of stories from Warren Buffett. What about your own? What was your first factor? that enabled you to perform What's your story? Okay, we might be here all night. No. <laughs> <laughs> My story was already given by Boyas. And that's it. He gave the whole story. I think what I would, I, let me put it this way. I would say that when I, and this is the thing, this is the way it is for most of us in life. Many times when we make decisions or we might enter into a business venture or buy a stock or whatever else we do, start a venture, whatever we do, it may not work, right? So many times we have initiative. Like a few years back, I bought an insurance company, not in the stock market, I bought the company. And it was a mistake. I, I realized within three months of buying the company, it was a mistake. And uh, I was thankfully able to sell it just a little bit above the price we bought it for and, uh, and was done with that. So many times we do these things where it doesn't work out. But the thing is that the payoffs are so asymmetric that the ones that work, they work so well that they more than make up for the ones that don't work. And I think like Teddy Roosevelt used to say, the man in the arena or nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I think I'm always trying to see, I'm always trying to make sure that Anytime there's something which seems to have an asymmetric payoff, but where the where if it doesn't work, it will ruin it. be something that can be tolerated. Then I wanna I wanna do that. And just to give you an example of, of these asymmetric payoffs is that when I when I was thinking of bidding for the lunch with Buffett, my my wife at the time found it weird. She said, this is kind of strange. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and what's the point with whatever. You want to do it. Go. So she was kind of... So one, so the lunch money goes to charity. The lunch money goes to charity, right. And uh, so my thinking at the time was, and this was 2007, at the time I had a net worth of about 85 million. 
a large portion of that was because of Buffett's intellectual property that I was using for free. So my take was there's a tuition bill deal, right? And so I felt like, okay, what is the appropriate tuition to pay? I said, two million is fine. If they paid two million, it should be okay. Because there would be also more earnings in the future, right? So I was bidding for the lunch and I said, I'll keep bidding until I hit two million if I have to. And the bidding pool was at 650,000, so we didn't get there. And my only objective in in doing the lunch was just to thank him. I didn't have any agenda. I just said, I want to, he's willing to take a bribe to sit down for lunch, which is great. I can say, thank you, Warren. I actually at the lunch told him, listen, Warren, you will not understand this. I need to touch your feet. And when I touch your feet, you need to put your hands on my head and bless. So he said, Monish, I'll do whatever you want. Okay, so he went through that with me, even though he didn't understand what was going on. And so my only agenda was to be able to thank him. Now what ends up happening with that lunch is that a friendship develops with him. But then the more important thing is he introduces me to Charlie Munger. Lunch with Charlie was way better. And then much closer friendship. I, when I was in California, we would calling meet at Charlie's place for dinner at least once every two, three months. I'd play bridge with him probably at least twice a month, it'd be like Friday afternoon to five o'clock or so. And so much rich interaction and several times in the last few years when I had issues, problems and so on, not related to investing, I brought it to Charlie. And I got incredible advice and incredible perspective, which was very helpful. So I never expected that from the lunch. The lunch was just to just say thank you. So then later my wife would say, it was, other than marrying me, the most smart thing you did. <laughs> so it was, so I think I find, and I think even in your case, the, the question you asked about Dakshana, the thing is that when I started Dakshana, one of the things that I understood, it's been about 15 years now, is that giving money away is far more difficult than making it. Especially giving it away effectively is much more difficult. And... I started to give it away when I was 43 because I felt like if I got into my 70s or 80s, I would be too old and I would have no energy and I would not be able to do anything other than just write a check. So I felt, and especially I was going to be giving money away in India and I'm, at that time I was living in California, I was not planning to spend much time in India. So it would be delegated very heavily and the odds that we would get taken for a ride and that we would lose money were extremely high. And when we started Dakshana, I just had a very simple model. I said that we would give away 2% of our assets every year. And I didn't really care if the 2% went with no results as a complete fraud and we lost the money. I said if we lost the money the first year for 2%, the next year we put another 2% on. And we'd keep doing that with the idea that I'm not an idiot, I'd keep learning. And, and so the idea was that we, so the difference between investing and charity is in investing we have to go, we try to go low risk, high return. We try to minimize that downside, maximize the upside. In charity, what you have to do, if you want to succeed, you have to go high risk, high return. So you have to swing for the fences, baseball term, like only, or in cricket terms, only go for sixers. So you might get bowled out, but you only go for sixers. And the only way to move the needle in charity is to go for sixers. And uh, so we found, I just by accident i ran into this guy in india super 30 he was taking 30 kids a year very poor kids and he was training them for the iit entrance exam which is a very tough exam and he was getting 27 of them 27 out of 30 28 out of 30 and i went to visit his facility he was running in a slum in in patna his mother used to cook for the kids and he used to rent these almost slum-like homes for these 30 kids to live while they were being coached. And he and a couple of teachers basically donated <coughs> time to make it happen. And he was a very gifted math teacher, so he was really good at it. So I told him, why don't we scale it? 
right? I said, I'll fund you, and why don't we take 30 to 300? And he said, I don't want to scale. I don't want any outside money. He was running tuitions on the side, which was funding this 30, these 30 kids who keep doing that. So one of the things that has really helped me in life, a core mental model I've used a lot is the model of cloning. Most humans are not willing to clone. They think it's beneath them. So I asked Anand, I said, Anand, do you care if I replicate your model, if I clone your model? He said, yeah, the it's a very good thing. Please go ahead and clone it. I'll help you. So I decided that there was already this guy doing this model and I wanted to do it on an industrial <coughs> scale. So I said, okay, we basically will do this model. We had several things that we didn't know how to do at that time. We didn't know how to find the kids. And, uh, but then we found an amazing school system run by the government, which is a magnet school system, which we did. What's your next book? <laughs> there are two books I have yet to write. But the problem is, knows what the answer is. That's why you ask these questions. The problem is, I can't explain why because we read at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. So I can only give you the title of the books. And then I'll let Pradeep explain to you in the next meeting what the books are all about. So, one book I have yet to write is called Adventures in Vegas. And so I'm looking forward to writing that book. It's a wild place with some wild adventures. And, uh, and the other book that I have yet to write is How to Talk to God. Humans are clueless about many things, they don't know how to talk to God. And I need to explain how to talk to God. So those are my two books I have yet to write. But Pradeep will explain why. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Alright, thank you.